Uh, today we're going to be wrapping up our unit on equilibrium, and it is one of the big five in AP Chemistry. Uh, we already covered kinetics, it was right at the beginning of the year. Thermo was um, our second one that we covered. Equilibrium is number three. We'll follow this up with acids, bases, and then finally we'll talk about electrochemistry. All right, and this unit, um, the main focus has been on obviously equilibrium. We introduced the idea of equilibrium constants, which are K. Um, the first question on the AP test, the first free response question, is always an equilibrium question. So it could be a KSP problem, solubility product, it could be a KC problem, concentration, it might be a KP problem with pressures of gases. What we're going to find in our next unit, acid bases, is there's also a KA for acid dissociation, there's a KB for base dissociation, and then we can talk about water as well, which is KW. All right. So as we go into acids and bases, a lot of what you're learning in equilibrium, we're going to do the exact same stuff with kind of just, we're going to throw pH into that and calculating pH values <coughs> and seeing what's happening with hydronium and hydroxide. All right. So today, we're kind of going to step a little bit away from what we have been doing with the K values. And we're just going to mainly talk about phase changes. So phase changes are things like boiling, melting. They're going from one phase or one state of matter to another state of matter. Um, so the first thing is just what are types of phase changes. And probably in your notes, leave a little bit of space, but we're just going to put SLG for solid liquid gas, right? And if we have a phase change that's going from solid to liquid, what do we call that? We call that melting. And if we go from liquid to gas, that is called, um, we usually call it, or oftentimes there's two words that we like to use. There's an official word that we use in chemistry, uh, but oftentimes students will say boiling, and that is a type of this phase change. Boiling happens when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Um, we can also just have evaporation, which those two don't have to equal each other. Vaporization doesn't equal atmospheric pressure, but evaporation has to do with the intermolecular forces and the surface tension on our surface liquid. Uh, but both these things, boiling or evaporation, are really under the category of vaporization. Okay. And then if we go all the way from solid to gas in one fell swoop, it would be like dry ice, and that is known as sublimation. All right. And then we can go from gas to liquid, and that is known as condensation. So I would get dew in the summertime because cold air cannot hold water as well as warm air. When it cools off at night, the water comes out of the air. And then we have liquid to solid, which is known as freezing. And then lastly, there's not a good example for this, other than if the pressure is right and the temperature is right, this happens. But gas to solid is known as deposition. And again, there's not a good like everyday example. <coughs> That's just what it's known as. All right. A couple things I would like you to know with this is um, thermodynamically, if we're going from solid to gas, these processes, so melting, vaporization, and sublimation, are all endothermic. They all require an input of energy in order to take place. Okay. And then the flip side of that is if we're going the opposite direction, um, if we're freezing, if we are freezing things, if we are condensing things or depositing things, these are all exothermic processes. All right. So again, these give off heat, which is kind of weird with the freezing. Um, but if we just do a real quick example, um, we get a red. If we have an apple, all right. Here's our apple, and um, you're a Florida apple farmer. All right. And every two to three years, looks more like a tomato, but that's right. Um, every two to three years in Florida, they usually get a hard freeze, okay, where the temperature drops to the mid to upper 20s. And if you watch the news, whenever that happens, and it doesn't happen very often, the farmers freeze their. Why did I do an apple anyways? They don't. I, whew, man, I'm not thinking. I've got the day off, and whew. All right. So in Florida, what do they do? They grow oranges, Mr. Burkett. All right, yes, they do. So here's an orange, all right? That is much better. So here's an orange and a stem. All right, so in Florida, where they don't grow apples, I'm sure they do, but where they really grow oranges, and their economy depends on oranges, if it's going to freeze, all right, every two to three years, 
they spray their oranges with water on purpose so that they freeze. All right, they get a nice little ice cube around them, or maybe a little Pac-Man ghost. But what happens is when they freeze, because freezing is an exothermic process, that is freezing is exothermic, heat is given off, right? So as water turns into ice, heat is given off. Some of that heat escapes around the orange, but some of that heat escapes into the orange, right? So not only does it have a nice little igloo to protect it and insulate it, but as that ice freezes, it actually warms up the orange inside the ice, all right? So instead of, um, let's say the temperature outside is maybe a cool 28 degrees Fahrenheit, inside our orange, it might stay 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and therefore the water does not freeze and the fruit is saved. Woo! All right, so that is just a side note. It's going to make our podcast longer, but that's good, good info to have. Right. And it is going to be heating curves. And these can also be cooling curves, and cooling curves are going to be the exact same thing, but opposite. All right? All right, and this is figure 1138 from your textbook. Okay, so still in that same um, phase changes section. And here is a heating curve. Um, time is just listed on the bottom. Um, it's just, you know, this is initial time, and we are going towards final time. And what's being, what's happening here the whole time is we are adding heat, all right? Um, let's say if this is a heating curve for water, we can define a couple temperatures over here on the left hand side on our y axis. We could say when water melts is at 0 degrees Celsius, and when it boils, it's at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? So, um, let's see. A couple things about this. If we have a heating curve that starts as a solid and ends at a vapor, there's always going to be five sections. Okay? There's going to be three slanty sections, and there's going to be two flat sections. The flat sections, notice, are equilibrium is happening, all right? Which is like why I include this in the equilibrium section, as well as our kind of our phase changes. And in these flat sections, phase changes is occurring, all right? So during the solid portion, okay, or the slanty part, during the liquid portion, and during the vapor portion, as we are adding heat, kinetic energy of our substance is increasing. All right, and when kinetic energy is increasing, kinetic energy is related to what? Kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. So as kinetic energy is increasing, what's happening to our temperature in these slanty sections? Temperature is changing, and it's changing positively. All right. So as we have liquid that's zero degrees, its molecules moving very very slowly. As we heat it up to 100 degrees, its molecules start moving very very quickly, but it's still liquid. All right, so we're going to go back to our notes over here. All right, so heating curves really have um, kind of three equations that relate to them. Um, one of them you're already familiar with. Q equals mc delta t. And we can use this equation for when we have the slanties, when we have a solid, when we have a liquid, when we have a gas. How come? Because the temperature is changing. However, when the temperature is flat, okay, so if we go back to um, our heating curve, when it's flat right here, if we tried to use the equation which I just wrote down, Q equals MC delta T, if we tried to use it here, what's the change in temperature? It is zero, so Q is going to be zero. But are we adding heat in order to melt something? You betcha we're adding quite a bit of heat, okay? So there's another equation that allows us to calculate what heat is, okay? And um, that equation is simply this. Um, it is delta H, typically, is equal to mass times the heat of fusion. All right? And then our third equation that we need to know is, again, a delta H equation. And it's going to be mass times the heat of vaporization. All right, so these two equations are equations we use for phase changes. And then really the only thing you need to keep track of is that fusion has to do with melting. All right, even though it really doesn't make sense why it's not called 
um, heat of melting, heat of freezing, something, but what in the world fusion has to do with, I don't know. And then vaporization makes sense for boiling. All right? Um, if our temperature is going up, okay, so if temperature is increasing, our delta T is a positive value, all right, which means we're adding heat to our system. It is endothermic. However, if we have a cooling curve, okay, if we have a cooling curve, our T is going to be dropping and our delta T is going to have a negative value, all right, which makes sense because it's giving off heat. And what happens is heat of fusion tells us what melting is. Heat of vaporization tells us what vaporizing is. But if we are freezing, okay, so freezing um, equals negative delta H of fusion. And then likewise, um, boiling, or I'm not, not, not boiling, condensing equals negative um, delta H of vaporization, all right? So this is the energy required to either melt or boil something. Um, if we're doing the opposite, it will require the same energy, but with the opposite sign, okay? Um, I have an example that we could do. I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, well, I'll set it up. You might skip this. Um, I think there's um, one problem, maybe two, that you have to do. But our example would look something like this. Um, calculate the amount of heat. Calculate the heat. Heat needed to um, to change 40 grams of ice um, from negative 30 degrees to um, 160 degrees Celsius. All right, and typically with these, the easiest thing to do is just to draw a little picture, all right? And I would, if it's talking about water, I'm gonna put two lines here, zero and 100, all right? I'm starting at negative 30, and I'm ending at positive 160. So if I draw a heating curve, I'm gonna have a slanty line, but at zero, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna start melting my stuff, and I know that's a flat line. And then once it's all liquid water, I'm gonna have a slanty line again, but what happens at 100? It's gonna go flat again, because I'm gonna boil stuff. And then once it's all gas, I can start heating my vapor up to 160 degrees. So I have five sections, all right? And we might just label these one, two, three, four, and five. So for my first part, I'm going to use Q equals MC delta T, all right? So in order to calculate heat, so my mass is 40 grams. And then our C changes depending on what state of state of matter our um, um, our substance is in. So the C for water as a liquid is 4.184, but when it is ice, it is 2.06 joules over grams degree Celsius. And then our temperature change stops at zero minus negative 30, or really zero plus 30, so it's a positive change. And we'll do that calculation in a second. Part two, notice, is going to be my heat of fusion equation, which is simply mass times the heat of fusion of water, which is 334 joules per gram. Joules per gram. And we're going to get an answer. All right. Let's scroll this up a little bit more. And then three, um, we're going to be back to heating up liquid. So our mass is never changing. So mass, um, now our C for water is 4.184 joules over grams degrees Celsius. And our temperature change this time is going to be 100 minus 0. And then at 4, we are boiling our water. So again, we're going to be back to our new equation, which is just mass times the heat of vaporization. And heat of vaporization of water is 2,260 joules per gram. And then lastly, we're back to a slanty. We're heating up our gas. So it's MC delta T again, so mass, the specific heat of um, steam is 2.02 .02 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then our temperature change this time is 160 minus 100. All right, and we're gonna get five answers. Um, 
and we would end up with an answer of 127,800 joules if we add all that together. All right, so that is it for equilibrium. Um, just a bunch of phase change stuff, a little bit different from our case stuff that we had been doing previously. All right.